So as John mentioned, um, you know, I'm going to kind of parlay the conversation from the ecosystems into the product. Um, and to do that, I, I really wanted to talk about a problem that I have personally, right? Um, uh, and this is a problem I've had multiple times, and I'm really going to talk about that as a, as a story. So my story, uh, or my story for the purposes of this discussion, really starts in 1994. Uh, so in 1994, I moved from, um, uh, you know, I was almost 15. My family and I moved from India to the U.S., right? Um, uh, and 1994 was an interesting time. Uh, there was a guy by the name of Jeff who started uh, selling books online. Uh, I think it went fairly well for him. Um, uh, but realistically, right, um, it was a time of excitement, right? It was a time of interesting viewpoints. It was a time of... Uh, really um, ideas kind of taking shape and, and becoming something tangible. Right? The dot-com boom hadn't quite started. Uh, we were really kind of at the early stages of, of what that looked like. Um, so what is my problem? Um, my problem is that I am an unknown, right? And, and I'll put it in context. So if I can get a, um, a hand raise, um, the people that are not from Singapore, but that live in Singapore today. Okay. Uh, similarly, the people that are not from a certain country, but live in a different country. Can we get those hands up? Fantastic. So you all share the same problem I have, right? Which is that when we move countries, right, all of our credit history, all of our um, you know, uh, paying bills on time, all of our, we bought a house, we've got mortgages, we're good citizens, all of that's gone, right? We are an unknown in a new country. So that is my problem, right? So in 1994, and, you know, I was still a kid at that point, really, it was my, my parents that had the problem, everything was paper-based, right? You couldn't yeah, yes, there was Mosaic and I think Netscape Navigator was the browser at that time and such. But if you wanted to do something, you really had to pick up the phone or go to an office somewhere, stand in a queue and, and figure out, you know, what forms do I need to fill in and who do I need to, you know, talk to and so forth. Um, I actually even remember there was one evening my mother was trying to cook and be on the phone and she, you know, shoves the phone. You know, this is again the, you know, the phone with the at this point, right? She shoves it into my hands and she's like, stay on the line until someone says hi and then, you know, come get me, right? So crazy, crazy times. So, you know, from that point on uh, through to, you know, 15, 16 years later, um, the world changed, right? So we had everything from the Googles, the Baidus, uh, the Facebooks, you know, every other social media aspect uh, really kind of came into play. Um, not just those, you know, but a number of companies, you know, came and went, right? So, uh, of course, BlackBerry, um, you know, our dear BlackBerry uh, came and almost is gone, but, you know, we'll figure out what that looks like. Um, I love my iPhone, right? Uh, Android's been around. Um, we've got SpaceX, right, which uh, came in with the aspect of we're going to, you know, go into space and then come back and it's going to be cheap, right, relatively, um, versus what NASA was doing and so forth. So, so life had moved on, right, and these companies have uh, really fundamentally changed uh, our lives, right. And why did I pick 2010? Well, I picked 2010 because in 2010 I moved um, to Australia from the U.S., right. Um, there's the, you know, proverbial kangaroo. Um, so this is, again, you know, 16 years after my first major move, I now have a supercomputer in my pocket, right? I am super excited. I walk into uh, National Australia Bank, right, one of the big four banks in Australia, and I say, look, here's my passport. Um, I would like a bank account, please, right? And I'm thinking, computer to computer, right? We've all done this before. They're going to make some crazy API call. We didn't call them APIs then. And they're going to contact Bank of America, where I've been a loyal customer for many, many, many years, have the top of the line products, have two home mortgages with them. And they're going to come back and say, hey, you're a cool guy. We want you as our customer, right? 
Imagine my surprise when nothing changed. <laughs> Uh, the only thing that, of course, changed was I could fill in an application online. And at the end of filling in an application online, it said in really lovely font, please print this application out, take it to the post office. And in Australia, the version of it is you have to show 100 points of ID, right? So two forms of photo ID and one uh, um, proof of residence. Now, the problem with the proof of residence, of course, is you need a bank account in order to pay the bond to get a residence. Um, so I got caught in this funny little loop of how do I do this, right? Um, so luckily for me, I was able to just wire some money over from my American bank account into the real estate company's account, and they were happy to hand me over the keys. Um, but this is a problem, right? This is a problem because why is this so hard, right? Um, and all of you who raise your hands, right? you all have faced some version of this problem. Um, uh, sometimes it's easier, some countries make it easier, but it's still a royal pita, right? Pain in the whatever. Um, you know, the, the thing that really galled me, of course, was I had been working in the IT industry now for, uh, well, almost, what, 15 years or so at this point, um, and I would built APIs, right? We, again, didn't call them APIs back then, but I had built things that allowed companies to talk to one another, to exchange information, right? Here I am thinking, gosh, you know, why is this so difficult, right? Um, in my professional life, I could clearly see how we could solve this problem, but we just weren't solving this problem. So a little bit about, you know, what I do. Um, uh, as John mentioned, I work for a company called Level. Um, we fundamentally believe that in order to innovate um, in this day and age, you need technology, right? And, and I and my team basically help uh, our customers do interesting, innovative things with technology, right? Now, why do I tell you that? Well, I tell you that because these are the things that most organizations worry about, right? And most organizations really care about. Um, now, I stole this from one of our payments uh, presentations, which is why it says merchants and consumer, but you get the gist, right? It's a, this is the business, that's their customer. That could be an internal customer, that could be an external customer. I'm going to talk about it in terms of me, of course. Um, the biggest reason why companies do things, right, is um, you, 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 either, you either do something because the heat gets to you, or you see the light, right? Um, this is the heat, <laughs> right? Uh, it's um, governance-oriented, it's regulatory-oriented market dynamics, right? We work with customers to really talk to them about how they can do uh, know your customer aspects, how you do counterterrorism, uh, how you do um, you know, GDPR compliance and so forth. Uh, and the general idea, again, is, you know, how, the, the thing that I want to kind of pull out of this is how do you know someone is who they say they are, right? We do this all the time, right? Why can't we extend it to also my use case and your guys' use cases? From a company perspective, this is the light side of the house, right? Not the heat side of the house. Uh, we really talk about, you know, um, consumer acquisition. Isn't that the, the lifeblood of any organization? is to get net new customers. Well, the other part of it, of course, is you try to retain your customers, make sure that they don't go to your competition. Um, how do you make sure that you continue providing iterative value uh, to your consumers and so forth? Um, and of course, you know, reduce fraud activity, right? Because the last thing you want is to get fined and blah, 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 and pay lots of uh, money to, to, customer, to regulatory authorities. But this is the slide that I care about, right? Um, when we talk about immediacy of capability, again, I point you to my smartphone, which I literally use for everything. Uh, folks who are here in the morning saw me reading notes about the, the presenters as I was emceeing. Um, I'm running my presentation off of the supercomputer, right? Uh, this thing is my lifeblood. It's how I pay everything. Um, but the aspect of that that I want to pull out, of course, is if something doesn't install in 20 seconds or less, right? And I'm, by the way, I'm not a millennial, right? But I'm on the cusp of, of, of caring about it that way or not. 
if something doesn't install in 20 seconds or less, unless there's a very specific need for me to hold on to it, it's gone, right? I don't care, right? If it's too hard to use, I don't want it. Um, um, the, the delightful and simple experience comes in on the, on the back end of it. Once I install something, if it's not up and running in five seconds or less, delete, right? The delete part is super easy. It's wonderful for me. I'm a minimalist. If I don't like something, it's gone, right? Um, those two things, I think, together, you know, again, form part of the why can't things be easier, right? Uh, and the middle item is, is the most interesting one for me at the moment, you know, and, and I think um, Emmeline, who I don't think is here, but uh, earlier today presented about data breaches and so forth, um, you know, every time, because of GDPR, I go to a website and a, thing little po a little thing pops up that says, you know, we would like to save cookies, blah, 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 blah. Um, I didn't used to care about that until it started telling me on every single web page, right? And now I get a little paranoid. I'm like, what are you doing with my data? Um, because it's made it explicit, right? And now I care a lot more about it, which is precisely the point of GDPR, just precisely the point of data, data ownership and so forth, right? So the, all these things come into play. Um, and the more I kind of think about this, the more I wonder, are these organizations that I help, right, that are kind of the tier ones, tier twos, et cetera, of, of this um, region and, and Asia Pacific and the world in general, could these be the answers to my problem, right? Could I somehow guide them? Could I somehow influence them? Uh, could I somehow convince them that there's an opportunity, right? I would say, and I don't know how many of you looked around, but I would say a good like majority of this room is that customer, right? Is that customer who's, who's gone somewhere and said, gosh, wouldn't it be easier if my identity kind of went with me? Um, so I really see that as an opportunity, but the flip side of that opportunity is again, the worrying of what happens when someone does bad things with my data, right? So Rachel Botsman is, by the way, a brilliant, brilliant woman. She, um, she teaches at Oxford University, one of the world's uh, renowned expert. Um, she, her title, I think, is actually like trust expert or something like that. Um, uh, and if you haven't heard of her, go look her up on like TED Talks and such. She is fantastic. Um, and she really talks about this specific thing, right, which is in her studies, in her research, in her talking to all sorts of different people across generation lines, across organization lines, you know, the trust is eroding, right? Um, now, we, we just talked about an opportunity to go to a bank or to go to an organization that we trust and tell them, hi, could you do this thing for me? Or if I don't trust them, how do I really you know, ask them to do this, this thing for me? Um, uh, this is, again, echoing uh, Emmeline's presentation, right? Um, I don't trust large companies, and I don't trust governments, right? Three billion user accounts, <laughs> right, compromised. Um, and, and again, these are just some numbers that I pulled out, right? Um, Equifax, which is ostensibly the authority for background verification for banks, telcos, you know, all sorts of important players, government organizations uh, in the US. They're one of the three uh, consortium players who uh, talk about credit ratings, right? That governs everything you do uh, from can you buy a house to you have a credit card and so forth. Um, you know, 143 million consumers, right? They lost the data or the data was compromised and so forth. Well, it's not just big companies, right? It's also governments. Um, for those that are in Singapore, obviously, you know, somehow affiliated with Singapore, there was a big data breach, um, I think it was last year or the year before, I can't remember, um, with all the health data. And closer to my home, uh, Victoria government also got um, compromised. Um, just this morning, I was reading about um, uh, the, um, uh, the Wipro um, breach uh, where you know, um, someone got into the Wipro computers and then kind of ended up on their customers' computers. 
uh, turns out that it's not just them, right? There was um, uh, two other organizations were also affected by a similar um, hack. Um, so again, you're, you're looking at certainly there's an opportunity to do interesting things, but there's also a flip side of do you trust these organizations and, and how do you trust these organizations? What can they do and so forth? Well, the answer, of course, you heard earlier today is ecosystems. Right? They solve all your problems. Um, um, why, why do I say ecosystems here? Well, you know, I, I believe truly ecosystems are unique. Um, uh, I had the pleasure and benefit of being part of uh, Red Hat uh, for almost eight, eight and a half years. Um, and, you know, products and all these things aside, the fundamental thing that I took away from my time there was being part of the open source community, right? Um, uh, and that's something I wasn't expecting before I joined that company. I just thought, eh, you know, product company, just like any other company. But the fundamental belief on the engineering team to think about ecosystem, to think about the community and how it all comes together and how you share, how you are open and transparent about things really, really resonates with me, right? Um, and so, you know, we come back to this uh, image that I showed you earlier, um, you know, that, that little uh, green uh, tick mark or check mark, um, you know, is in my head, right? It's like, ah, oh, how cool would it be if that happened? Well, you take that in the context of an ecosystem, right? And, and on, on the first part of the ecosystem is the trust uh, and identity act aspect, right? So what if there was, you know, I don't know, a, a chain of blocks, let's call it, um, uh, where somehow you could go and, and talk to not just, you know, in my case, the US government, not just the Australian government, not just, um, you know, a bank and so forth, but you could go to all of these uh, entities and with some aspect of quorum, they could tell you, yes, the gentleman who walked in with this passport is the real deal. This is their you know, credit worthiness. This is their capability and so forth. This is their trustworthiness. Um, and, and that goes to whatever the institution is, right? In this, in this example, it's, it's a bank, right? But it could be anything else. And that bank then using, I don't know, um, uh, let's say APIs, um, <laughs> connects to the entities that I've been talking to in the US, right? Uh, loyal Bank of America customer, as I said, loyal Verizon customer, loyal, well, not really loyal utilities customer because I change them all the time. Uh, but why couldn't this institution go in and say, is this person who he says he is? Yes, we've confirmed that. Can we now go figure out basically what level of capability that they had? Um, and they would find that not only did I have top of the line bank accounts, I had the all you can eat um, you know, mobile plans for seven years or something like that, right? Um, so when I walked into Telstra, or rather in this case, why couldn't this organization go to the leading telecommunications company and say, hey, this guy just moved here, he checks out, uh, would you like to offer him some sort of capability rather than what I had to do, which is walk in, get a prepaid card, <laughs> you know, and then, then just like struggle through it for the first few months until the company decided to, to help me out and so forth. Now, if you take this ecosystem thing a bit further, why couldn't that organization also go beyond the basic needs that I have uh, and say, would you like a credit card, right? Coming from the US, credit cards are obviously very important to us. Um, other uh, nationalities may or may not be. Why couldn't it go and say, would you like a car? Um, would you like insurance, right? Would you like some shopping aspects done? We can connect you into our trusted ecosystem, right? Coming back to what uh, Kevin was talking about this morning from the Zero team uh, of, of recommending things to a consumer because I don't know who the right players are. I don't know who to go talk to for a mobile plan. I don't know who to go talk to for utilities. I have to figure all these things out. Why can't this entity provide me that value, right? Why can't they do the work for me, thereby earning my loyalty, right? Thereby earning my business uh, as, as a customer. So to do that, and you heard this earlier, and I don't want to belabor this point, um, you really can, can do this, I think, in two 
uh, two very different ways, right? And, and it, these two are the extremes. Obviously, you can do some things in the middle as well. Um, you can be a specialist player in this space, right? So uh, we, we talk about um, Stripe, right, as a, as a payments provider. That's literally all they do. Um, Zero talked about, uh, of course, you know, being able to provide a specific capability. Um, Google Maps, again, you know, yes, they do a bunch of things in the background, but for our purposes, oh, hello. <laughs> Um, for our purposes, they provide one specific capability, which is mapping capability, right? Um, uh, that could be from here, uh, um, the company that spoke just before lunch. Uh, or you can do it the other way, right? Which is orchestrating a set of platforms or creating yourself that platform that orchestrates a number of APIs. Um, we see companies like Uber, right? Um, Uber uses Google Maps. Um, Uber uses, well, they used to use Stripe way back in the day, now have, have moved on to their own internal payments capability and so forth. Uh, but you're now orchestrating this, this ecosystem. Um, wow, I didn't realize everyone heard my, my problem and decided to come in. Welcome. <laughs> um, you know, so, so the ecosystem play is also quite interesting. But more and more, I'm convinced it's, it's a combination of the two, right? You, you create a smaller ecosystem play, and then that gets consumed in a larger ecosystem play, which then can, gets consumed further and further and further. Uh, now, these are companies that we probably all recognize, other than maybe Tulio, which uh, was one of the first API-centric companies out there that did telecommunications. We're going to hear from a company called WaveCell later today that does something similar. Um, but, but again, the idea is you could do this with banks, you could do this with insurance houses, you could do this with telcos, you could do this in retail. Uh, all of this is possible. Right? Now, I bring you back to I am your customer. Right? I have a problem, and I would like to enroll all of you in helping me solve this problem. Um, but it's not just me. Right? We, we saw the, the raising of hands earlier today. Uh, earlier in this presentation even, uh, where a good, you know, probably more than half of the room raised their hands at this point. But to, to put, a, put a specific number on that, this is from the United Nations um, study in 2017, right? So just shy of 260 million migrants worldwide, right? These are people moving wherever, right? Up and down, left and right across the world. Um, and specifically within that, about 60% of them moved into what's called the um, high-income countries, right? So uh, this is basically countries in the top third of, of uh, GDP in the world. Um, even if you say, look, 50% of that number is asylum seekers and so forth who may or may not have um, you know, specific needs around banking and so forth that adheres to uh, existing banking customers, right, or adheres to telecommunications uh, companies, uh, retail companies, and so forth, you're still talking about a very large uh, number. Um, and this could be your customer, right? I could be your customer. So here it is. Here's my call to action, right? Obviously, we're all here because we love APIs or we want to love APIs or we want to do something with APIs. Um, and I borrowed this from South Park. I don't know if we have any South Park fans in the, in the crowd. Uh, but you know, step one, do the thing. Right? Step two, uh -huh. step three, profit <laughs> right? from the underpant gnomes uh, um, chapter or episode. Um, well, I fill in step two for you. Right? Step two is. Go find that diaspora in your own local region, right? Go find people like me who are in pain, right? And who would pay money for this pain to go away, uh, who are looking for someone to come in and say, do we have a solution for you? Um, go find them. Second thing, integrate across this ecosystem, right? Find the banks, find the retailers, find the airline companies, find you know, whoever uh, in this space 
um, go integrate with them, connect across your geographic boundaries, uh, find ways to, to appeal to this, this customer that, that is um, uh, basically just standing there looking around going, how do I do this thing? And at the end of the day, provide them a delightful experience, right? So I'm pretty sure that in, I don't know, the next two to three years, I'm going to move again, right? It's just part of who I am. My father put the wanderlust in me. I tried to get rid of it, but I know I'm going to move again. Um, I want to take my reputation capital card, right? My identity, my history, my who I am. I want to go to this new country, walk in and say, this is who I am. Give me your recommendations. Solve me this problem. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, Akil, for kicking off this, this series by talking about the, the all-important person, the, the customer. Me. Oh, and and <laughs> step, yes, of course, of course. Um, and especially step two, the uh, what what to do next and how to how to approach people. For those who are interested in Akil's statistics about the uh, the, the data breaches and uh, security is important. Uh, tomorrow morning in the technical track, we have a series of presentations on how to secure APIs, how to gain consent from customers to securely share their, their mm -hmm. data. So you, you could certainly be interested in that. But I, I guess I'm uh, interested in perhaps uh, tease out this step two a little bit more because we all came here wanting to learn more about how to build and leverage APIs. Yep. And uh, I, I think... Uh, in Kevin's keynote presentation this morning, he talked about the, the importance of, of outreach, of finding, um, finding people that you're interested in. The, the diaspora um, example you gave, I think, is an example of gaps mm -hmm. that APIs can help fill. Yeah. Um, any other gaps? Uh, look, I mean, there, there's a thousand gaps out there, mm. right? Um, and, and these are the gaps that in, in, in general terms, right, um, as Kevin also mentioned, none of these technologies, none of these things are new. All of these things exist, right? We've, we've just ignored some of these problems uh, because it's sexier, right? It's more exciting to think about innovation and, you know, um, how, how do we develop a new product and so forth. Um, I guess my, my sentiment on this is this customer already exists, right? And this customer, me, you guys, you certainly, you know, you've moved a few times. Um, you know, the question is, you know, how do you, how do you go find this customer and immediately convert them into a paying and loyal customer, right? So my point is this money is literally just sitting there. How can you go collect that? Um, now, APIs are an aspect of that, right, whereby you connect into international providers, you connect into international organizations, um, and, and all it is is literally a lookup, right? A customer you know, lookup exists in every single organization around the world. All you have to do is call up your counterpart in whatever country you want to start playing with and say, right, you know, as an example, US and Australia are part of the three eyes under the you know, multiple eyes uh, um, aspect. They share um, an incredible amount of classified information back and forth. If they can share that information and share, you know, defense plans and so forth, why can't they? You know, why can't uh, you know the top four banks in Australia go talk to the top four banks in the U.S. and say, "We kind of know you. You know, why don't we formalize this thing?" Right. Um, mm -hmm. That that's really all I'm saying. So these APIs already half exist. Right. Mm -hmm. They're just not connected. And my point is, connect them. All right. Thanks that, very much. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks cool. very much. Okay.